welcome to all of you who are joining us for this last chapel service of the academic year. We're sorry we had to go virtual on everybody for this last chapel service, but our preacher of the day, a dear friend of Beeson Divinity School, Dr. Ralph Douglas West, has taken ill, and uh, we're grateful to him for providing us a sermon uh, online that we'll incorporate as part of this worship service. Dr. West is well known to almost everybody here at Beeson Divinity School. He's an alumnus of Beeson. He's a board member of Beeson. This year, he's been co-chairing the steering committee that's been helping me raise funds for the Robert Smith Jr. Student Scholarship. Uh, and he's just a dear friend. He's been in our pulpit many times before. He's a friend of many of us, and we are praying for him as he recovers and continues to minister at the Church Without Walls in Houston. Uh, most of you know this as well, but the Church Without Walls was planted in Dr. West's house, which was a small house in Houston, Texas in 1987. And between 1987 and the present day, it has grown and now has three beautiful campuses with 20,000 members. We're going to have to get Dr. West to campus one of these days to teach a church planning course because the Lord sure has blessed his church planning ministry. A reading from Psalms 16 from the New English Stand New International Version. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy place who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Let me today express my genuine appreciation publicly to my Dean, Dean Doug Sweeney, for the invitation to be here on the campus of Sanford University Beeson Divinity School. I always look forward to my time here, back home at my alma mater where my doctor fathers and doctor mother has breathed breath into my life. I have so many fond memories of being at Beeson and being nurtured and trained in pastoral theology and practical ministry. I could go on and on and on with my expressions of genuine appreciation. Persons like uh, now the retired Dean George and to my big and elder brother Robert Smith Jr. And then to Norfleet Day and uh, Ken Matthews and, and Dr. Thielman, Frank Thielman, people like that. And then my blessed memory of my doctor father who nurtured me through my studies and programs, Dr. Calvin Miller, as well as friends that I've made over the years and churches that I have preached uh, to and at and in. I often think about the congregation of the Advent. I tell people that when I retire, I'm going to be an Episcopal priest. 
but I'll stop right there with my salutations and my greetings. Thank you again, Dr. Sweeney. And uh, though I haven't had an opportunity to spend in-person, face-to-face time with you, your work and the deeds that you're doing in such a brief time are affecting all of us <clears throat> who are graduates and alumni, alumni of uh, this wonderful institution. I want to invite you to open the Word of God with me to 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1. In verses 3 through 5, a doxology, an exclamation from the lips and pen of the big fisherman Peter, who praises God for his birthmarks as a believer. It's a kind of Christian forensic that he gives to us. Hear God's word for God's people today. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. DNA allows us to make distinct, distinguishable differences between or from one person to the next person. In the early 20th century, Scotland Yard would use the process of fingerprinting, those unique digits in the fingertips of a person's hand to identify who they are. In many cases, Persons who had committed crimes have been traced down by the fingerprints. At the end of the 20th century, DNA had been introduced into some of these criminal cases, namely the most famous criminal case at the end of the 20th century where the defendant was acquitted for the crime of murder. Sometimes the DNA is used to convict, and other times the DNA is used to exonerate. When the Apostle Peter is writing to us, this big fisherman, I can't help but to believe that he is spending much of his time meticulously reflecting and looking in the rearview mirror of how he has been identified by the birthmarks and the DNA characteristics that have been put into him spiritually. Now, on one hand, I'm obsessed with some of these CSI programs because right when you think that someone has completely gotten away with the crime, someone steps in with new evidence, though 20 years, 30 years have passed, and it's used to convict the guilty. But then there are other exciting times. Right here in the state of Alabama, just up the road in Huntsville, Brian Stevenson has, attorney Brian Stevenson has used his wonderful legalistic mind and gifts to have men and women acquitted after 20, 30 years of being convicted of a crime that they were not guilty of based on the evidences of DNA. And when you raise that from a lower and lesser level to a higher, heavier level, what you discover is that all of us today are guilty 
in the court of sin, we are guilty, all of us. And yet, right when we should be sentenced to a a life of eternal separation from God, a great someone steps in with new evidence and lays it out before us and declares us right with God. No wonder in this reading this morning, it begins with this great exclamation of doxology. This is not a quiet note. This is a major key, a high note, where Peter is raising his voice saying, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you with me for a few moments look at the word of God and how God's word spells out for us evidences found in our spiritual DNA that allows us to join in the chorus of Peter. Praise be to God, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins by saying, I want you to, I want to give you some evidences. And so I want you to begin by finding the fingerprints of God's abundant mercy. In his great mercy that God has given to us. If it was anybody that knew that the mercy that had been extended to him was not based upon the proportion of what he deserved or what other people thought, it certainly would have been Simon Peter. Capricious at one moment, given a great name and for many years never lived up to it, nicknamed a rock and he was anything but stable and sturdy, and yet now he's able to look backwards And thank God for his great mercy. Not because he was deserving of it, but because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ and the new birth that God had given to him through Jesus Christ. He gave him abundant mercy. That word for great grace is that's what it is, abundant. It comes from the idea of a plutocrat. When I was a boy, they would always image a plutocrat as a rotund man with a black vest with a gold chain. He was rich. And Peter may have been reading uh, the Apostle Paul in in Ephesians chapter 1 when he uses that wonderful line, rich in grace or rich in mercy or rich in his benevolence. And now he says, Great mercy, abundant mercy has been bestowed upon us. Not in proportion of who we are, but in proportion of what God has done for us through the person, Jesus Christ. Great grace. Peter knew it. As you listen, you know it. As I preach it, I definitely know that I need God's plutocratic mercy. His abundant mercy, his great mercy that only he can give to me and to you and to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord who is able to deliver rescue and save. Several years ago, our hearts in the Christian community was broken when one of our seminary professors at one of our Theological institutions logged on to Ashley Murphy's adultery website. When his name was exposed, he turned the lights off on his own life because he knew that the community that he believed, that the community that he worked in was so fundamentalistic, so fundamental Christian, so narrow and parochial, that they would never extend to him mercy because, unfortunately, 
they were merciless. If, if you and I really take inventory of what God is doing in us now, none of us could stand in judgment regardless of how we feel about it. And the last thing that we would ever do is not to extend mercy that had been extended to us. <clears throat> Peter had experienced that mercy, the big fisherman. I know he never wrote without, as Frederick Buechner says about theology being autobiog autobiography, I know he never wrote once where he did not reflect. He was not morbid. He didn't live in the past, but it helped shape who he was at that moment when he had made great, great promises of how he would never leave or forsake God. When you need me, I'll be there. And at the very moment that our Lord needed him, he denied him. And then he remembered that day when God extended great mercy of restoration to him. No wonder he says it this way. Praise be to the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Born from above, made anew. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. He knew what it meant. But there's something more than finding the fingerprints of abundant mercy. There's the DNA of living hope. He was born into this new birth, into, and listen what he says, a living hope. The word of God is a thesaurus of images as it relates to hope. And Peter's not talking about some Pollyanna optimism. I hope my team wins the game. No, he has some bedrock, objective references of what hope really is and what hope looks like. The preacher in Hebrews, when he's preaching, he says, hope is like an anchor to the soul that when your life is adrift, it'll keep you sturdy. Or like the prophet Joel says that hope is like a door that opens inside. Mm. Or like the prophet Hosea that says, Hope is like a harbor in which you sail your ship to. Or uh, as Paul said to the Thessalonians, he says, hope is a helmet that you wear. These are images that we can wrap our mind around. Because there are moments where the currents of culture pushes us around and we need the anchor of hope to keep us sturdy. And when we feel lost and adrift and cannot make our way to the harbor at home and we need that kind of hope or we go into the battles of life with our family, our friends and community to stand up for what is right and we need the helmet of hope up on our head. Oh, there are those moments. We need to cry out how I need hope to lead me safely home. The Latins speak of this hope, Spiro, and they say of it that it means I breathe. It's breath. Some of us recall the experiment that the Norwegian psychologist conducted with a domestic rat and a wild rat. Now, I don't know the difference between the two, but he puts these rats into beakers. And this was his finding. Domestic or wild rat, after an hour of treading water, sinks. And after it sinks one or two times, three times, it would be done. And Richter took one of the rats out and gave it mouth to mouth resuscitation put it back in the beaker, but this time it didn't tread water for 30 minutes or 
rather 24 hours or an hour, it treaded for 24 hours. He discovered that day that with hope, a rat that would sink in an hour would last for 24 hours based on the hope that he might get out of the beaker. Now if a rodent can have that kind of hope, what more for you and me? But I know what you're saying, and I hear you, and I know you're right. Peter didn't just say that we were reborn into hope. He said a living hope because he knew that everything that Jesus came into contact with became a living something. Living word. Water, when it is touched by our Lord, becomes living water. Stones that are dead, when touched by him, becomes living stones. Hope that is touched by him becomes living hope. You see the inference here, don't you? It infers that you can put your confidence and your currency into a relationship. But if you don't have living hope when that relationship dies, your hope dies. You can put all of your investment inside of a business and an adventure and entrepreneurship. And when it dies, your hope dies. If it's not touched by the living hope. You can put your hope in education to achieve your highest aspired work. And if it dies, you die, even as I not, have not been touched by living hope. Bring your life in contact with the living Lord Jesus Christ and let him give you living hope. In 1926, it has been recorded that the most bizarre of all auctions ever took place. Now, there have been bigger and better and more famous auctions like the auction between Apple, Apple and Google a few years ago, but not bizarre like the 1926 patent auctions. <clears throat> 150,000 patents were up for auction. They had bed busters, bed busters that were supposed to bug Bugs, I guess, kill uh, bugs. It's, it was ridiculous. They had one tube that you could insert in your mouth and it was supposed to warm your feet on a cold night. Or the illuminated cat that was supposed to light up to startle and scare mice. When you read up on it, the people laughed about it. But one person made the best comment. While we laugh at these 150,000 patents, these are the dreams, hopes, and aspirations of many people who have put all of their life in these patents. And many of them have not sold. And now you have 150,000 broken dreams, shattered aspirations. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it drab like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or does it crust and sugar over like a surface sweet? Maybe it sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Langston Hughes was reminding us of what happens when hope disappears. We need hope. And we need hope in the one that can give us hope when everything appears to be 
hopeless. I was looking at Good Morning America 3 that comes on at mid-morning, and at the end, the two hosts, TJ and the other young lady, they had Dr. Ashton on, Dr. Jennifer Ashton on, and she closed with her inspiration, and she said, here is a riddle, and I, I haven't committed to memory. I just heard her say it that day, but she said, what keeps down heart failure and fatigue and keeps you healthy, helps you sleep at night? And I said, stop smoking. And uh, she said, no. Somebody else made a comment, no. She said, the answer is hope. Hope. And when I heard it, I thought I said, living hope found in Jesus Christ. I have to move on from there because there's some more evidence that's been brought in by the big fisherman for us to look at. He says, not just finding the fingerprints, of the abundant mercy are finding the DNA of a living hope. He says, wait, but I need you to find the strand of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wait, listen to what he says now. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection, there it is, of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter says, I remember the day when I heard these words, follow me. And that day, I didn't bother to sell any of my accoutrements as a fisherman. I shut down my Gmail account. I strike through the big fisherman's incorporate sign. I padlocked the door and I walked away from it and I followed that man from Galilee. And I became one of his students and I slept beneath the starry vaulted Palestinian skies and I listened to him in the morning, afternoon, and night teach us lessons about what it meant to follow him. I saw what other eyes never saw. I heard what other ears never heard. I felt in my heart what no other hearts had ever felt. And I said, he's the, he's the living Savior. And then I remember when things got dark, those years were bright, but I remember when things got dark a trial, a denial, a crucifixion. And those bright eyes that sparkled with so much future imagination had been closed. That tongue that spoke the most eloquent words that no man had ever spoken before had been hushed. That sign that had beat with love for those that he came in contact with had been speared. Those hands where he had broken fish and bread had been nailed. Feet that had walked in places where other people would not go had now been riveted to a cross. And I must admit, I said like the other people in Luke 24, our hope is gone. But then, thank God for those women who brought the message to me to meet our Lord in Galilee at that very moment when I finally made it to the tomb. <clears throat> and looking inside of it and seeing it empty and saying, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. I knew then that my living hope was the result 
of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. There's life in Christ. When we're in Christ, we experience that life. Watchman Nee illustrated on one occasion, he had a letter, and he took that letter and he put his letter inside of his Bible and said, where this book goes, this letter goes. <clears throat> if I were to mail my book to the hospital, my letter would go to the hospital. If I mail my book to the White House, my letter would go to the White House. If I send my letter to the prison, my letter would go to the prison. If we're in Christ, <clears throat> wherever he is, that's where we are also. Where Christ is, that's where we are. That's what Peter was getting to when he talked about praise be to God. And no wonder he opens it up with that grand doxology. Praise be to God. He raises his voice. By our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who by and through his abundant or great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say one final thing now that Peter would want us to know. And he says, there are some footprints that I want you to follow. You've seen the fingerprints and the DNA and the fiber, but I want you now to follow some footprints. Those footprints are going to lead you to a great inheritance. And see if you can contain yourself when you hear about the inheritance that God has prepared and has given to you now, and one day you shall receive. And into an inheritance. And hear the words that I want you to see and listen to. Kept in heaven for you this inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This is your inheritance. This inheritance reminds us of a couple of things that there's a durability attached to it, a superiority and a quality. He says on one hand that, notice what it is, he says, uh, is incorruptible. It won't perish. It will not fade away. It's in a place where thieves and robbers cannot break in. They can't assault it. They cannot take it. I want to know something like that. And the reason why I want to know that is because on earth, it looks like that there is no safe place to put anything. I mean, everything seems to fade away. You know, Paul used a kind of uh, illustration once when he talked about the outward man uh, perishing, the inward man being renewed day by day. It alludes to, uh, for us, that, that our bodies are attacked daily by uh, cellular terrorists, these free radicals that come in and just break everything down. You see it everywhere. You can leave a book untouched and the pages turn yellow. You see the wiltering of the leaves of vegetation. You can see cars that are just sitting out in these automobile kind of uh, graveyards and they just rust and rot away. Or you can keep something in the hopes of saying, well, I don't wear it and I don't wear it for preservation. And when you get ready to wear it, mall have come and destroyed or it's become so thin it just rottens away with this gift that God has given to us this inheritance it is according to the word of God it's incorruptible but it's not just that it's imperishable 
That is, it's undefiled. It will not, rather it is, it is said to us that this very word that is imperishable, it's undefiled. It's undefiled. It's incorruptible, it won't perish, it won't decay. But now we have, it's imperishable, it's undefiled. It won't fade away. Several years ago, I remember in my first trip to London, and I was so excited. That was on, I didn't want to see Big Ben. I didn't want to get to Westminster Abbey. I knew I would get to that. I didn't want to go stand in Poets corner, anything like that. I wanted to go one place, the Metropolitan Tabernacle where Charles Haddon Spurgeon had stood and preached for years. And this is around 1990, uh, you know, just a couple of years less than a hundred years of Spurgeon's death. And I mean, when you, when I read, let me say, his biography and the throngs of people that came and the production of his uh, sermons and being printed in the, <clears throat> in the London Times. I couldn't wait to get to the place that I know still had to rock under the influence of his preaching. I said, could you take me to the Metropolitan Tabernacle to the taxi? driver and and he looked at me with a blank space I said well Dr. Spurgeon Mr. Spurgeon preached he said I don't I, you know I don't have a clue of what you're talking about I could believe it because in my estimation a name and ministry like that should never fade away but everything down here fades. And that's one reason I'm a Christian, because I have some things that will never fade away, an inheritance. And notice that this inheritance, and the reason why I know it will not fade away, is because what Peter says to me. He says, who through faith are shielded, or this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. That is, the safest place for this treasure God has protected it, and no one shall come in and assault it. On planet Earth, probably the most protected place in the world is Fort Knox, where we know as the U.S. Bullion Depository. This place is heavily protected. It has over 5,000 precious metals, $137 billion that is protected behind a 22-ton door. Try unlocking that and opening it. But suppose you did do that. You would have to get 10 staff people that have parts of a code in which they do not know which sequence it goes unless someone tells them. But let's suppose you could get through that. I don't know how you would get the merchandises out. You would have to get past Apache helicopters, armed guards, surveillance cameras. You get the idea. Is it any wonder during World War II when the nations were under threat that it would be in Fort Knox where the crown jewels of England would be deposited, or the Gutenberg would be, Bible would be protected, or the Gettysburg Address would be housed, or the Magna Carta would be put there. And yet, when you look at your life, you are more valuable than the Magna Carta, more valuable than the Gutenberg Bible, more valuable to God than all the precious metals and documents that you can find. And he says, and I will keep it and secure it just for you. Can I say one last thing? My time is up, but can I say one last thing about this? And that is, look at the very next line, who through faith are shielded by God's power. It's a military term that reminds us that from the moment that we confess the Lord Jesus Christ 
from that very moment that we acknowledge him and know him and he moreover knows and loves us. According to Knox, he has given us a garrison, a protector, someone to shield us, to go with us. Can you imagine that? That from the moment that you met the Lord Jesus Christ, you have never been alone. That God has given you a garrison to keep a watch around you. He who keeps you neither slumbers nor sleeps. That God has built protection around you and watches over you. No wonder, and I'm done now. That Peter, when he comes to, to this portion, and this is just a segment of it, he goes on and on up to verse 12 about these very DNA strands. And he reminds us today. That's why I said, praise God. And praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to raise our voices that way too. And thank him that our DNA now, when we were guilty, that greater someone named Jesus Christ came in and touched our lives and gave us abundant mercy, living hope, life because of the resurrection and an inheritance that we could never work or earn. Those are the strands, fingerprints, the DNA that you and I possess as believers in Jesus Christ. No wonder we should say praise God from whom all blessings flow. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God.